What's up, AP Psych? Welcome back. Hope you're doing well out there. We are on to our last video on Unit 7, Cognition. We started with the different processes of memory, then we went into critical thinking, um, and now we're finishing up with language and thought. And the reason we include this language and thought, which we'll talk more about language um, in the development unit, is because there is a little bit of a debate around um, what came first. Does language influence the way we think, or does the way we think influence our language? And so there's a little bit of, of that debate that we need to, to discuss and go over and evaluate some of those theories. And that's where we'll begin. So to understand language, we want to talk about the basics here first and the parts and pieces of language structure. So language is our spoken, written, or gestured word. It is the way we communicate meaning to ourselves and others, right? We talk to other people. We talk to ourselves, things like that. And it transmits our culture. All these different societies around the world have all of these different languages that um, shows and displays and shares their culture in different ways. And language is how we can communicate that um, throughout the world. So language structure. At first, language, its most basic units are called phonemes. They're the smallest distinctive sound unit in a spoken language. Okay, so those are phonemes. So for example, bat. We think of the word bat it has three phonemes. B, A, T, right? They're not syllables. They're just the smallest distinctive sound unit. Okay? Um, so for another example here, chat. It also has three phonemes, even though it has four letters. Because you don't say it as K, H, A, T, right? No, you say CH, A, T. So that CH forms its own phoneme, its own small distinctive sound unit. And that's what a phoneme is. So that's the smallest structure of language, and we build up from there. So as you combine phonemes together, you can form morphemes, right? So these phonemes kind of morph or turn into um, the smallest unit that carries meaning, right? So phonemes have no meaning. Morphemes are the smallest um, units that can carry meaning. Okay. It may be a word or maybe only part of a word, depending um, on if it can change the meaning of a phrase or a word. So, for example, milk. Milk itself is a morpheme. We can't break it down into any other meaningful um, parts. But pumpkin has two morphemes in it, pump and kin, because those two sections of the word have their own meaning. So it's the smallest unit that can carry meaning, so we can break that one up. Or unforgettable, for example, there's un, for, get, and table. Okay? You might be thinking like un, why is un count as a morpheme here? Because it can change the meaning of a word right? when you add that. So it counts as a morpheme. So we have phonemes and morphemes. And as we move along from those, you start to build words. right? Some morphemes can be words like... Uh, and then you can build phrases composed of two or more words. And those phrases lead to sentences, right? And that's how we have developed language um, and spoken language through these different parts and pieces as you create it. Within language and its structure, we have grammar. So this is a system of rules and a language that enables us to communicate with and understand others. Okay, so grammar has two parts. One... Semantics, we've heard this term before, and it has a very similar meaning when we talked about semantic memory. Um, when, you, when you semantically remember something, you remember the meaning of it. Um, you remember the facts and the logic of it. Uh, semantics and grammar is very similar, and we have syntax. Okay, so we'll go over each one individually. Semantics is the set of rules by which we derive meaning from morphemes, words, and sentences. Right? So just like semantic memory, you get the gist, you get the meaning of something. Semantics in language allows us to understand the meaning of communication. So, for example, a semantic rule tells us that adding an ed to the word laugh means that it happened in the past, right? It's adding meaning to the situation. We say, oh, that happened. That was a past, something we're thinking about in the past because we know the ed was added and we understand the meaning of that word, the semantics of that word. Okay. Then you have syntax, and this is more rules for combining words into grammatically sensible sentences. So semantics is all about meaning. Syntax is all about grammatically correct sentences. Okay? So in English, for example, there's a syntactic rule 
um, that adjectives come before nouns, right? Like White House. Right? We talk about the White House. But in Spanish or other Romance languages, um, it's reversed. It's Casablanca, which means house, white, right? So it's flipped. Um, so different cultures have different syntactic rules, and it can change the grammar and the structure of sentences. And can also what makes it difficult to learn new languages as you learn the structure and syntax involved. So moving forward, now that we understand the basic structure and function of language, how do we develop it? How does it begin in people? Well, children learn their native languages much, much more before they learn basic things like two plus two or math, right? Language um, is one of the earliest things that begins developing in children. So on average, after the age of one, we learn 3,500 words a year. And by the time you all graduate high school, you will have amassed roughly on average 60,000 words. It's pretty impressive, right? So we grow quickly in this language development. So when do we learn, learn language? There's a couple different stages. First, uh, the first stage is the babbling stage. If you've ever been around a baby, like a new um, beginning at around four months, uh, the infant can like spontaneously utter these various weird sounds like goo goo ga ga right like ah goo right all these different things um, and babbling it's not an imitation of adult speech um, that doesn't happen until about nine or ten months right and we can't differentiate a baby's native language until that time right so until about nine or ten months old um, a psychologist a scientist wouldn't be able to tell what country a baby was born in by their babbling stage. It all sounds essentially the same. It's just that baby pushing out um, essentially just phonemes, right? Um, so as you get through the babbling stage, around a year, uh, it, it varies for, for each child, but beginning at around the first birthday, a child starts to speak one word and makes um, like family adults can understand them, right? If you've ever been around a, a, a one-year-old, and they say something that makes absolutely zero sense to you, but their parents get it right away. Uh, it's because they've been around them enough and they can understand what their one word stage is meaning, right? So maybe this baby says doggy, right? But they might mean, look at the dog out there, look out the window, there's a dog, right? They mean more than they're saying, but they don't have the language capability yet to speak it. So that one word stage. Um, it usually begins with short words that begin with consonants like B, D, M, P, or T, you know? dada, mama, potty, things like that. Um, at this point, children are capable of understanding quite a bit of language um, that they hear before they can speak that same level of language. Again, if you've ever been around a little one, a one-year-old, between one and two years old, you can speak to them and they will understand what you're asking them to do and they might do it, but they cannot respond in kind, right? They haven't gotten to that stage yet. As development continues, they reach the two year, the, excuse me, the two word stage before their second birthday. Okay. They can start to speak in these two word sentences. Uh, it's also called telegraphic speech uh, because the, the child speaks much like a, like a telegram in these choppy two word phrases like go car. But that means, you know, I'd like to go for a ride in the car, right? Or this kid want egg, right? Hey, can you give me that? I want this egg. I would like to have it. Um, and so, as kids develop, they start to go into this two word telegraphic speech phase. And eventually, as they continue to develop, um, they will reach and be able to put together longer phrases. Um, you know, things like mommy, get ball, or I need potty, right, with syntactical sense. Um, and by early elementary school, they can even enjoy and understand humor right, by the time they're young, right? So they might laugh at a joke like, you never starve in the desert because of all the sand which is there, right? It's a play on words, but they can understand that play on words. Um, and they might laugh at it. So as they grow up, they get into those longer phrases after two years of age. Okay, so we've talked about the structure of language, how it develops early on uh, in babies and young toddlers. And there's a few theories out there by psychologists who will talk about the way that they think language develops. So you might wanna write some of these names down or star them on your notes. Uh, B.F. Skinner, we've heard of him before in the learning unit. Uh, he viewed babies as empty vessels that language must be put into, right? Remember, behaviorism is all about observable things. So uh, he believes that 
we learn to talk through operant conditioning, through rewards and punishments and imitations. Okay. So it can be explained not just through reinforcement, like when your parents, you know, a baby speaks a word for the first time and their parents give them all this love and attention and support and reinforcement. Uh, but it can also be done through imitation, imitating adults and what they say. You get a young child to imitate a word that you speak. I mean, through association and learning what that way. Um, and they learn to speak because being rewarded um, for making sounds that are close to adult speech, you know, that's like shaping. You're slowly shaping these behaviors and this language in a child because they're being rewarded for it. So he believed that we're not, we're not uh, born with the capability of language, but language is being placed into us through operant conditioning. That's B.F. Skinner. On the flip side, you have a, a psychologist by the name of Noam Chomsky, and he essentially just opposed Skinner's ideas. He was suggesting that the rate that we acquire language is so fast that it can't be explained through learning principles, and thus it must be inborn in some way, right? We pick up words so quickly, 3,500 words a year after the age of one, that it can't, we're not getting rewarded for all those words, right? There has to be something else going on here. So he supports this idea with, um, the, the, with it that, excuse me, he supports his theory with the idea that languages have a universal grammar, that there's like this similar underlying structure of all world language. Um, and in people, we are all born with something called an LAD or a language acquisition device. This neural structure or system of the brain for understanding language. Right? And he would argue that that language ac acquisition device that we are born with is switched on by exposure to language in our environment. And that allows us to pick up that specific language and reproduce it over time. So the difference between Skinner, Skinner says we're not born with the ability um, to produce language. We are operantly conditioned to do so. And Noam Chomsky says there is this language acquisition device that we are born with that helps us develop language quickly as we develop. So um, we do know that there is some research out there that language must be learned early on during something called critical periods. Okay, so well before our first birthday, our brains are already discerning word breaks by statistically analyzing the syllables that go together. So before you can even speak, right, before um, that one word stage comes up, babies are already putting together syllables and understanding, oh, this is how language works. Um, and we call that a critical period of child development, which we'll get in much, we'll get into that much more deeply when we get to the development unit. But if this, if we're not exposed to language during this critical period, it will be much, much more difficult um, to develop and, and reproduce that language as we grow. So back to the original question, language and thinking. Does language influence thinking or does thought influence language? Right. And what they found over time really is that language and, and thought are intricate, intricately intertwined. Right? They go together. But we'll discuss a couple of theories again about that question. So first, you have a psychologist by the name of Benjamin Worf, and he put forth the idea of linguistic determinism. He essentially suggests that language determines the way that we think and perceive the world around us. Right? As we learn language, we begin to think differently about our world because we have the words to describe it. Um, and for example, he studied the Hopi Indians and he noted that they did not have past tense for verbs. And so therefore they could not really readily think about the past because they didn't have the words to cognate or cognitively process that idea, uh, which is an interesting thing to think about. So, you know, language can influence the way that we think. Uh, another example, when language provides words for objects or events, we can think about these objects more clearly and retain them. Okay, so here's an example. It's easier to think about two colors with two different names. If I told you, you know, think about green or think about blue, you're going to be able to pull that up much more quickly, right? But then I said, okay, well, you know, <clears throat> I don't really have a, a name here, but think about like, think about one color that's blue and it's a little darker and one color that's blue and it's a little bit lighter you're going to have a problem kind of thinking about that because I didn't give you a specific name for them. These colors do have specific names. If you knew them, you'd be able to think about them more clearly. Another example, uh, many Alaskan cultures 
have different words for different types of snow. Um, you know, we, we talk about snow. It's like, oh, it's snowing outside. We don't really discuss the texture of it, the wetness of it, um, the largeness of the flakes, things like that. They have specific words that they can use that bring up that idea immediately in their minds. Okay? So they can think about things differently because of the language that they have. So we also don't just think in words, though, right? Um, to a large extent, our thinking is language based. Like when we are alone and we talk to ourselves, we all do it. Even if you're just thinking in your mind, that's you talking to yourself in a way. But we also can think in images. So when I say, um, you know, open up the hot water tap, when you think about that, you're not thinking the words go open the hot water tap. You're visualizing that in your mind. Or if I said, um, you know, go ride your bike or you're out there riding your bicycle, you're not thinking about those words. You're not thinking in your mind, pedal, pedal, pedal. You're envisioning it happening. So we don't just think in, um, in language. We also can think in images. So that kind of brings us to our final point. Um, when we're imagining a physical activity, that activates the same brain region as when we're actually performing the activity. So again, we're not thinking in language there. We're thinking about doing this activity. Um, and so most psychologists believe that it is probably our thoughts that influence our language and they go hand in hand. Um, so you have Worf who says, no, language influences thought. And you have many psychologists who are saying, no, thought influences language. But realistically, they both impact each other. Okay? And we'll talk about some examples of cultures that have terms or phrases or words for things we may have never even thought of in the English language. And that can change the way they think about things. But also imagining a physical activity, um, you know, can change the way that we think and the way that we speak about things as well. So just kind of going back to this idea of what, you know, what influences what? Does language influence thought or does thought influence language? Well, it's kind of like the nature nurture debate. They go hand in hand. They both influence each other and the way that people develop and interact and how their cultures um, develop as well. So that wraps up our language and thought notes. Let me know if you have any questions and we'll see you in class.